Oh, oh wait, it's okay. Over there. Great work. We have a nice choice today. Yeah. <laughs> I see. So I assume that we have nobody remote today. Is that correct? Correct. I don't know what we're going to do with all this free time. We don't have to read the motion. But... <laughs> no free time. <laughs> <laughs> Ran to fill the available time. All right. Um, let's first do the minutes of our September meeting. Do we have any comments, questions, additions? Yes. Okay. Let's to read them. Hope that helps. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing we need to. All those in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Oh. Moving on. <clears throat> Announcements? We should just get quiet when you came back in. We didn't have <laughs> All right, and then public comments. Just one Perhaps. listener. If if anyone online would like to make a uh, public comment, please please use the Zoom raise hand function now. Doesn't look like there's any public comment today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So continuing in today, we have our old Mike Powers, who's going to talk about regional patron usage and a map-based visualization. All right. I don't have any slides for this, because I don't enjoy doing slides. Uh, but we do have an interactive demo, so hopefully that will be almost good. Um, do we need to cut the lights? Yeah, can we cut the lights? Sure. So this is a, uh, a couple weeks ago, David and I, David, uh, Library Director Plunkett and I, uh, co-presented a poster at the VLA conference poster session, and it, uh, the poster session is basically a science fair for librarians uh, yeah. at the conference. The poster about a project you did, and that's the what you see in your handout, and it's really just a jumping off point to for people to kind of circulate through the uh, session and talk to you about what your project is. Uh, my project at a basic level is uh, David shared some uh, patron records with me, <laughs> all the patron records, certain aspects of each patron. And I put this through a process called geoencoding. So we have our the uh, address, the, the kind of text-based address of, of each patron. But the geoencoder turns that into a lat-long coordinate that you can put it on a map. So uh, we're going to see, and then based on the other uh, fields that are in each record, we can slice and dice and categorize and kind, of, and kind of visualize. I would put this in a category of sort of data exploration. There's not a specific question necessarily being answered here. It's just uh, we can slice and dice and visualize in a map and see if we learn things or if that points out some uh, interesting uh, areas that we might want to investigate further. So um, that's sort of the, the intended scope. Um, I will say this came out of a personal, it was, it was a class that I was taking probably about five years ago is really when I started this and you could, it was, I wanted to learn some of these specific technologies and part of the class was, well, go find a data set that's online or, or elsewhere and kind of work with it. And I said, well, uh, maybe it'd be interesting to work with a real world data set. So I asked David, hey, would, you know, given that I, I'm interested in working sort of along these lines. Uh, would it be useful for the library to, you know, have me work with this data set and then show you the results? And he seemed to think it might be useful and uh, gave me access to that data. And then about two years ago, I sort of re-engaged because we had, uh, I think, Andy Bauman from the uh, from Albemarle County asked us during the uh, Central Library conversations, hey, do you have sort of a heat map? of your uh, of some of your user base and I said well, well I have a good start at that and then I added um, use this new platform called Streamlit because it has a heat map and it has a heat map so it kind of lined up straight with with uh, with that request and in fact I can show you I'll show you one specific uh, set here where 
where we see that how how central library is is sort of uh, being used by Alberto. Thank you. So in general, you can do two things. You can basically uh, come up with a, a subset of all the patrons, or or you can use all of them, which is what you see right now, and then you can categorize that in different ways. And what we're seeing right now is a home branch. So all the patrons. Oh, and I, uh, the home branches, Northside has this many. Uh, okay, yeah, pop up. So it, out of this data set, there's 14,000 for the home branch of, North, uh, of uh, Northside, you know, so on, so on and so forth for other. And then when you scroll down, we see this beautiful map that they're colored in, and you can see uh, home branches. If we recategorize this to nearest branch, for example, we see just geographically from each patron's location what branch is the nearest and, and their average distance. So if you're if you're jump around a little bit, we can see right here. I thought this was interesting, just the demarcation between these kind of three four libraries. And then to see, well, some people in Louisa County, that's the border. Well, Northside is their closest branch. Uh, some people in Albemarle County, well, Green is their closest branch, so on and so forth. Um, and I'll show jurisdiction. This is, again, in this data set, how many patrons are assigned to each jurisdiction, but then we can see them on a map. And each time I re-categorize, uh, it takes a, a minute to run and replot a bunch, you know, because there's 40,000 areas being plotted there. So what was interesting to me was we're always talking or, or often talking about these out-of-area patrons. And now we can see on the map, well, here's where they are. And I was never clear, well, where, where are they and where do they live? And so we can see here uh, the pink ones are out-of-area. There's a you know, surrounding Scottsville, there's a, a group of those, but they're across the border, so they're out of area because they're not actually in Albemarle County. Same thing here, these folks by Palmyra, Palmyra are not in any one of our jurisdictions, but there's a little population center here, so they're out of area and can go wherever. Uh, we can see, just, I'm trying something on the fly here. So if I say the jurisdiction, so what you are plotting is the person's home address according to their library registration. Maybe not be home, but yes, it's the it's the address that we have on file in our records. And so actually that brings up a, an interesting point and Meredith, I'll, I'll get to you in a, I'll get to you in a moment. So if we go back to all patrons and categorize by jurisdiction and we kind of zoom in, Still uh, refreshing here. So if I zoom in, we see that the red dots are in Charlottesville, but there's some blue dots where in our records they're assigned to Albemarle County, but they're but the address uh, is a, locates them in, in the Charlottesville boundaries. And over here we see some red dots where so this could be somebody who signed up when they lived in Charlottesville and now they've moved here. Uh, so they, there's a mismatch. So one thing that uh, Dave and I have talked about, he's interested in being able to use this uh, to clean up some of the, you know, identify which of those are mismatches, clean that up, and there's and there's others sort of along those lines. Does that, does that answer that question? Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking about library usage and um, like I know a lot of people in green work in Charlottesville and tend to migrate to the libraries that are closer unless they're following kids around. Right. So let me uh and then I was thinking up. about the book. I'm also thinking yeah. about the outreaches that we have done and like uh Nelson's, you know, book vending machine and things like that. And this will really help with knowing maybe good placements for and good stops for bookmobile or good places for sure. vending machines. I have a follow up question. Yeah. So, every one of those pink dots is Susanna for the library. Uh, and fee to use 
each dot is a patron. Or, yes. or they even have friends are subsidizing it. That's one of the reasons for Hollywood, right? right? If, if you have a, a Scottsville mailing address, but you don't live in Albemarle County, the friends subsidize your out of area. Exactly. And we don't, and, ha and still, ha we don't, do we know how many of those? I mean, they were. We, we do. How many of the friends subsidize? Yeah, I have that. I don't have it with me. But, that, but the, the pink is kind of a splendor. Thing. But you, you that's but one of the Palmyra, so don't... no. If you lived in Palmyra, you'd be paying thirty dollars to okay. so we're going to the Glen. Going to the Glen but those ones there have cards, so they have paid thirty dollars. And then just a follow up: Is someone then in the system with two addresses, or are you getting another address for this person? How would you each. say that someone is in two places? So each dot is a patron. It's the It's located. Let me let's. Pull an example. So this red dot is a patron whose address in our records corresponds to this location in Albro County. But we have a separate field that is what is their jurisdiction in our in our records, uh, which may or may not map because we don't have this geographic. So if I lived in Charlottesville and I moved to Alamaro, but I originally signed up as a Charlottesville that might be a reason why resident, then yeah. you might keep me in Charlottesville, even though I say now I live Correct. in until okay. we until you renew. So that because I was like, are you comparing it to other data like voting rules? Like this no, is like a complicated project. Right now it's all well. There is there is an extension where where it could be some sentence data involved. But, uh, <laughs> Well, right, but but this allows you to visualize that, okay. and you can see, oh, and it gives you a, a sense of how you know what percentage of our of our dots are just visually are in are you kind of in the wrong place. We can see a, there's a yellow one here, so this is uh, Louisa assigned to Louisa jurisdiction, but they they live here. Um, let's. I did, Meredith. You had set me up perfectly for. Oh yeah. So that let's was Martha asking about like finding the yeah. locations. Yeah. Them. I will state that this data is is older than the adding the Louisa and Green, uh, Louisa and Nelson bookmobile stops. I should you should say that, and I should also have started with a huge uh, asterisk. Uh, we so David gave me most recently kind of um, seventy thousand rows, and then there's an additional uh, digital data set that contained eight that most of them were overlapping but 8,000 rows that weren't also in physical uh, and when I performed this geolocation I performed that five years ago and I, I've been getting the features but I haven't rematched all the new records so right now we're working with a subset of 47,000 have been matched and there's another 30,000 that need to be matched all these features will work the same way just needed update those values in the data set and put the data set here for, for it to remote. So don't get too attached to any particular, you'll see things that are have two decimal points of precision here. That's not the exact real number, but it, but the patterns of sort of relative frequencies of things uh, and percentages sort of are, are kind of indicative, I would say at this point. So take this at a high level of trends and patterns and not uh, the, the very specific numbers. But so that that is a, so I just didn't, it, it's more fun to do the bars and colors than it is to rematch the other 30,000 <laughs> records. But, so it ended up being last, so, and it didn't get happened before today. Um, but I, w I did want to uh, talk about, and Martha's question, give me a great, so I'm going to categorize by all, I'm going to filter down to only the green residents. It's remapping. Okay, fine. I'll, if I'm categorizing by jurisdiction, those are all the green ones. So there's 3,700 in this data set that's been matched so far. Uh, and I can put it to their home branch. Okay, most of those are have a home branch of green, but some have a choose to have a home branch of north side and central. And this is similarly to the jurisdiction. It's just something that we care that we have assigned to that field, however they chose. But that's their home branch. It's, that's what we have in our in our record. Or it could be that they uh, they work near near there and just mm -hmm. go. Yeah, and they chose. But it's something that somebody put in that that's where I go record. Most. That's yeah. So it's well, where they got the most, or is that where they got their library card? It's it's where it starts with where they got their library card, but then they can change it because it's your default hold location too. So okay. if so you, you if you worked in, if you lived in Green and worked in Charlottesville and you were tired of having to every time change it to pick up at Central. 
you would talk to staff and they would change your home library to central. But yeah. it starts with where you made it. Okay. Yeah, but there's a separate that so far hasn't been tied to what, what the libraries that they actually use. And so we have a different category here called frequent branch, which attempts to, and there's some asterisks behind this, attempts to from some from our from our material. So patrons who show up as checking out materials most recently, it picks, uh, well, here's the one that you were the branch that you most frequently showed up in as the most, and it kind of shows wh where you act, because we don't keep the entire uh, checkout history for each patient, patron uh, in the location. So we sort of had to estimate that from a snapshot of here's how often this patron showed up as having checked out the most recent thing at, at various branches. Now, so the, the interesting, this goes back to the Albemarle County question. What we were able to show was, and let me just think for a moment how to do this. Uh, yes, if your jurisdiction was Albemarle County, three summarizing. My home branch is most often Northside. And you can see that down here in the map. These are only Albemarle County residents. You see these are sort of hollowed out. The Charlottesville's are, are being filtered away, but, but we have some dots where they're assigned uh, to uh, an address that's in those, within that boundary. But then if I change the frequent branch, well, let's see here. So of your home branches, most often north side, then second is Crozet, and third is central. But if I change it to the frequent branch that these Albemarle patrons actually use, central now is almost used as frequently, you know, by a ratio of 3,600 3, to 4,300. It now becomes the second most frequently used branch that's actually used by these Albemarle County patrons. Uh, so this was speaking kind of directly to that answer, and, and it gives us a little bit of uh, quantitative uh, evidence to Albemarle County to say, hey, this you're, this this facility is shared 50-50 by cost, and but your patrons are actually using it also, your your residents of uh, of Albemarle County. And is this only uh, print materials? Good, good question. So. Uh, my answer is, um, you're setting me up for my next thing also, which is great. Uh, well, you gave me all these questions ahead of time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the answer, so in, yeah, in terms of frequent branch, there's some complicated ways that we estimated it, but if there, the digital did not play into this calculation because uh, you don't go check out the digital material from the central library. You check it out from the digital branch. So if that does that sort of answer the question? Yeah, I was wondering if it had been filtered out because I'm thinking about all the books that I have been listening to lately. Right. I didn't go anywhere to get those. So it does get included in overall circulation totals, which is in part of parts of that are here, but you haven't seen it yet. We've just so far just been counting number of patrons that that land in various boundaries and then showing those on a, on a map and a histogram. So, so I did, did however- In calculating frequent branch, yeah. that's someone physically going to that branch and checking out materials. No, I believe it comes, so I believe if they requested the whole, so if I request the Laura Ingalls Wilder book from Greene County, uh, I'm gonna show up as on that material and that material is tagged at Greene, is that correct? Yeah. So it's where that's where the book is from. It's where the, it's book, where the book is from. Yeah. Okay. So it's not about how. And, and, so it's not where they pick it up from. The collections whole, use. It's how the collections move. Right? And oh, so and it's, and it's not. It's not to do with like events. People showing up for an event. Yeah. Or, so so it's yeah. only right. It only they use the material. I mean, that, for this that might impact it because people are in the library checking for it now, but it's not. It's not tied to that data. Yes. Okay. Right. I, I need a point of clarification. Um, so if I check out a book from Northside and I get it transferred to Green, is that counted as a Green checkout or a Northside because it was from Northside's collection? It's, nor it's counted as a Northside checkout. Ah, 
for right. the way that the JMRL has interpreted the regional agreement. Our monthly statistics will show you both. It'll show you how many you know, green patrons check things out, how many things went out from the green library, and then how the collections went from the official number is the collection. So, and Peter, I, I don't think we would actually have a way of, from the data that you track at the library level, of which physical branch a, a user walked into the door of, on a per patron uh, level. We, there's, there's, a, there's a different set of data that we have access to that, um, that tracks uh, the terminal number, um, which is like the staff's login, which is different per branch. So we can pull numbers we can pull information from that but not raw data sets we could get like a snapshot of it. right it's a snapshot but it also wouldn't be patron by patron to where you right. could put it on a map like this it would be it would be more a picture in time you know like tuesday tuesday afternoon here's how many items got checked out at central physically i just out of curiosity is there any door count data just yes. people coming in and out yeah we, we report that uh monthly for each location is that that's not in your we don't print it out every month, but it's in the on the online. Okay. How do you do that? Does someone I've never seen it? There's a little device. <laughs> <laughs> there's a little we have we have had to resort to that when the <laughs> devices don't work, but there's a little device at every door. You'll see it out up front here in the back that basically there's a line and you walk through it and it counts you. But what if I go in and out and in? We room? divide it by two every <laughs> Keep doing that because it goes in the front door and out the back door. Uh, but again, walk. What David just talked about is aggregate data. It's not uh, perpetual. Right. Okay. So then a new, I have two more. Thanks for all the questions. I have two more little features to demo on this. So, uh, oh, oh, she, oh, so three. So nearest branch we already sort of looked at, but it, it calculates out. If you see on this tool tip, uh, if your nearest branch is north. This is, uh, I'm going to filter by all patrons. Let's come back. Okay. If you're near the nearest branch to you is north side, you're three, you're an average of 3.6 miles away. If your nearest branch is Louisa, you're an average of 7.7 .7 miles away. It's just because it's a more spread out. Uh, if your nearest branch is Scottville, your average distance that you travel to go to Scottsville is 6.6. .6. And again, we see that on this map. I could start looking at. Here's Louisa, and so all these dots are, is they're just more spread out than these guys in here. The lowest one was if your nearest branch is central, your average distance to get to central is 1.6 miles. Right, exactly. It's just, so just the interesting. interesting if you put the bookmobiles routes in here and then uh, the yeah. book vending machine, and that's change some of the distances. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. Uh, I'd, I'd have to get sort of the addresses of some of those, but then you would yeah, basically. You how to do that. It's 50 different stops for the bookmobile. Yeah. <laughs> Which but one you, are you? You should be able to track it. You should be able to track it as a branch, though. You can track it as a branch here that would say, like, where are people that are using that collection? You know, mm -hmm. we just, the data's not up to date to include the two new jurisdictions. So once we load more data up, it'll already be in there. But again, if it's the collection, it, the you're saying that the collection is mm -hmm. where it is normally housed. Where are the bookmobile collections normally housed? It has its own collection, the bookmobile. So some of them are down here. You know, you saw that tour last month. The rest of them are on the bookmobile itself. So they're 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 but the location is it's like a branch. It's a branch. Yeah, their location. It's like digital. It's, so actually, you can see it right here. This. So they have to fit digital on there. So, yeah, there it is. You can. In this, within this data set, there's 600 patrons who count their bookmobile as their home brand. Well, Mike, you could filter the global filter by just bookmobile. You know, so home let's see, home bookmobile. Brand. Yeah, I can do that. Thanks. And see, uh, so I, I, my point being that this just doesn't have the new stops. But it will show you where they all are on the maps. So this shows you yeah, all the pink dots are users who are patrons who have, have bookmobile assigned as their home branch. And I'm sure if we mapped out the bookmobile stops, they would be pretty close to that same picture. You know, they live where yeah. it stops. The two last things uh, at the risk of overstaying my welcome here, <laughs> uh, but people seem interested. So. 
<laughs> so Dave and I were at the, during the poster session, uh, we're talking about sort of a ratio of, of patrons who use uh, digital materials versus uh, physical materials. And there's some, this is complicated and there's some asterisks because again, I didn't, there's eight, there's 8,000 digital only records that aren't even included in this set. And the, mat, the, the records that are included are from five years ago. So that trend hasn't been incorporated here, but just showing the, but what I did was, uh, and there's another problem, which is we have, uh, some patrons have been around for 20 years. So we have, we just have, they've checked out, you know, 5,000 books in 20 years and uh, 5,000 materials. And then I had from this, what David provided me was the last five years essentially of digital. So if what I did was take a yearly, I divided their total circulation, physical circulation, which is what the one value I got per patient by the number of years they've had their card to get an average number of physical checkouts per year. Then I divided the total number of digital, or I added back together the five years of digital, divided that to get an, by five, essentially to get an average of uh, digital checkout per, per patient. But my point is, because those are over different time periods, they're not necessarily precisely comparable. But again, we're getting some ideas here. Given those caveats, uh, only five, let's see, this number of users only have a, a ratio of, their, of digital items per year over the total number of items here, physical plus digital, are essentially zero or, or up to 5%. So most users in the data set, as I've described it, are not using very much digital uh, usage as, as an individual. Um, and then similarly, if the people who are almost 100% digital and have very few physical checkouts and mostly digital, uh, in this data set, that's 500, but this should be, if we took half of the 8,000, this, this should be about 4,000 high. So it should be sort of around this this level. There would be sort of a spike at the end here. Uh, and then we can see some dots here. This is different from the, ag David, this is different from the aggregate number of digital checkouts and the ag versus the aggregate number of physical checkouts. It's on a per patron basis. I. I kind of see what their mix is as an individual. And then we're looking at their, their mixes in terms of, again, red in this is mostly physical. And then blue, it starts to shade up to more uh, digital use as a percentage of that individual patron's use. Uh, and then on this visualization only, I put it, um, because one conversation we had, David sort of felt like people in that are in the middle of some of some uh, between branches and don't have a close by branch, your, your thinking was they were more frequent to use digital. I'm not really seeing that in this data set, but it might just be because I haven't included everything. I think also yeah. um, Wi-Fi Wi accessibility. Well, I was about to say it's counter. It's at the same time it's counteracted by if you're further away. So this this one is 30 miles away and it might be an out of area you're probably going to be in a rural area where you're not uh, connected as much and it's not as easy to access. So I just. A lot of my yeah. questions, Brandy, for Mike, had to do with Zion's Crossroads, right? Yeah. Like all right, the right. people in Louisa live, you know, not all the people, certainly, but well, there's. It's interesting when I looked at the map because knowing Louisa County and the way it's set yeah. out, the town of Louisa is very heavily yeah. shows up on the map, yeah. whereas the rest of the county just kind of scatters. So and there are more, there are, the population are growth in Zion's yes. Crossroads is yes. insane, but, but you know, the people there are, are using digital resources heavily, and uh, that other map about showing where they were closest to by the, as the crow flies, like they're closer to north side than to Louisa. Yeah. So let's put a pin in that, but if this is a, once I get the records match, then this is this graph is going to show up more accurately. But right now I'm not seeing a big trend that if, if you're further away, you're using more digital, you would expect a trend line looking like this. And it's basically flat. Uh, was there a hand? Yeah. I have a, a, a question that's maybe also kind of a broad question. Um, first, I thought this was really cool. And certainly as a new person, I thought this was like a really helpful like information, yeah, in a way that sort of get a lot of information quickly. Um, and I'm wondering 
are there particular questions related to sort of policy strategy or investments that we are specifically trying to answer or trying to explore um, you like how we might use data to answer them or are we more sort of exploratory in terms of what's out there? I'm just trying to sort of situate this in a so David, that's the question for David, but let me just frame it by this is a side project of just for fun. Uh, so <laughs> I like that this is your fun. It wasn't well for fun and, and education and learning some skills and so forth, but it's also I think useful back. I, I was able to see some useful stuff. So this particular project was not oriented toward any particular question other than Andy's question about can you show me a heat map of uh, at where Albemarle County, you know, collection use. So that kind of is specifically comes out here. But I, I, think, question. I think Syria basically uh, is a tool that helps the board as the board is going through to meet our strategic planning goals. You know, so uh, three of them got mentioned today, that Central Library Project, potentially uh, you know, the population for the and giant crossroad where we don't have a lot of again how to where best to, to put resources, where should we send the bookmobile and where should we put any sort of outreach uh, like this kiosk that's in uh, and uh, there was boards and you know, do you even want to put more? But each and every one of those aren't just this board saying, yes, we're going to do that. We require the partnership of our partner jurisdictions to say, yes, we will fund that. So I think that this helps answer the question, are there needs there that we have a perceived need? We think this, I'm assuming this, but is it true? And then here's some data to show to our funding partners to say, see, this shows that the people who live here are traveling to Charlottesville for service. And we, those are the three that are we get, get questions about the, well, first of all, we have to remind the Board of Supervisors and City Council in Charlottesville and Albemarle that yes, they do don't jointly fund X branches. And then, you know, usage uh, usage data like this, obviously much easier than throwing all the numbers at you. So I, right. I mean, we, we do have to be careful though, because the question is if we look and we say, oh, Zion's crossroads, they're just really using so maybe they don't need a branch. Yeah. That doesn't actually answer that question because yeah, they don't have a branch there. So yeah. of course they're not using it. You know. So I think it's a that would be more of a yeah. You'd have Can, to go. Can't to in the southern urban ring too. That's mm -hmm. another question that the board gets with some from people who live on that end of Charles. So they want a southern library for the some more stuff. Yeah. But but this could answer if you plopped a branch at this location. Here's your your uh, average distance now goes from seven miles to you know five months to whatever. So you could do that would draw you know there's some quantitative things you could do. Well, in terms it. of looking at equity, we're saying yeah. like okay, Albemarle you're, or Louisa, you're trying to serve all the people in Louisa. Now you're seeing this population shift over here. You're not being fair with your resources. Not yeah. to say close the current library, but should you? Have and the other thing to think about too is, of course, the library is not just material checkout. The library yeah. is meeting rooms. The library, you know, central place for children's right you know, programming, programming and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> those things. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the country. Can't you just they, go they to got the first one. <laughs> um, but I think Siri, this question came up also when Mike and I were at VLA, um, where people asked a similar question, and to me, it was mostly about. Uh, being able to prove or disprove assumptions that the library has had by visualizing. It's just much easier than, than other assuming that the people who live in this neighborhood are coming to the library because there's not a library close to them. Well, is that true? I'm assuming that the people in this neighborhood aren't using the library. Is that true? Is that assumption true? Uh, so I, I'm, I see it as a tool to help us decide where to best put resources, especially if that bookmobile stops. I think, um, and I'll toss this out here for today is like a might be something to think about in the future, right? Like if there are questions that we feel like we should be able to answer that require or would strongly benefit, right, from some sort of um, evidence base. I think it could be an interesting exercise to think about what those are because there's like what you maybe could answer today and then there's what you maybe could answer 10 years from now or further down the road and um 
and if some of the reasons why we can't answer those questions today is related to things that are um, infrastructural, right? Then there could be like like from a data infrastructure standpoint, then there could be things that you could that we could think about over time implementing that then position the library way future. You know what I mean? To be able to answer things. A lot of that, if you conceive of those questions, there's an, what I would call an instrumentation issue, which is you have to collect that data. And some things we're collecting right now, some things we're choosing not to collect. We don't. We choose not to collect a detailed patron history, and there's reasons for that. But if you wanted to answer certain questions, you might you might need that. So you'd have to you'd have to decide. Uh, right now, I, I would think of this as just a toolkit. If you want to be able to see things on the map and how that's useful in various ways. Uh, so I'll show uh, after the question. I'll have one capstone feature to show. But go ahead. I, I was just going. I was going to make a, a statement more than anything, which is that when I first started this project five years ago, I mean, what, the, I always tell our staff that uh, you know the biggest um, treasure that we hold for the public is their data, is their information. So we want to be very careful about how we share it and who we share it with. So uh, one of the caveats was that there is no identifying information in the data set. That Mike has, there are no names. It's all like a unique ID. And then also, you uh, five years ago, you um, yeah, I forgot to mention this. Minimize the the addresses. Basically. Yeah, the dots. So census blocks. Well, I saw this. myself on the yeah. I found myself. <laughs> well, you, so the dots don't land exactly on your house. It's your next door so, neighbors. So if this if this is your house, your dot got moved. It got uh, there's some noise. So the noise good. factor got added. So this this might be your dot, or or this might be your dot. It's hard to see. Yeah, I feel much better already. <laughs> so yeah, if you zoomed in on your house and there was a dot there, it wasn't yeah. necessarily your dot. It might it, well, and all the dots got jiggled. Dot at the end of my street in Crozet that said they used the Louisa Branch more. So I was, yeah, I think this that one down was not you. But that, I'm glad you pointed out there there was some anonymization that that happened. Uh, that point about privacy. To be clear, I'm not like a, you know. Uh, get all the data person, right? I think there's also space for if we can't answer a question because of privacy concerns, yeah. I think being able to articulate, right? Like, we're not going to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here's why we it. don't collect that. Information. Exactly. Here's a question we're not going to answer because of this, but, you know, we're going to use this proxy instead. Here's why. We're collecting that someone has checked out, you know however many audiobooks you've checked out this month, but not saying specifically what they are. I think that's, mm -hmm. to me, that's value. Like, do I care that anyone says? I think we would probably also want to protect how many you checked out. But really? you know, that's something for the board. Okay. Um, well, I, so I, I think it's awesome that Mike has gone off and done this in and, and collaboration with the library. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, have you guys talked about if at some point, the library become wants to become more reliant on something like this. Is there a, is there a way or a plan to bring it in house so you're not relying on an individual board member and a fun project? And that we currently don't have the staff resources, so with the board would we would have to talk about who that would be and how much we like what percentage of funding is going to. If only. We knew somebody at the school for data. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you also have an articulated to me at least that this is there's a specific question that we need to bring in house and internalize and rely on. Uh, I don't think he's I've heard that yet either. That it's an, something he needs to uh, have you know continue to rely on. So if, that, if that was part of the question. Yeah, I mean this conversation people are kind of thinking about how can we use in the future, yeah. and I just think. Yeah. If it starts to head in that direction yeah. where the yeah. library is going to rely on it and be yeah. sort of showing, you know, different jurisdictions. I, I don't want to be in the position of, of, of volunteer meeting. Five years from now. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, it, it, You've already it, put it, five in. <laughs> but it is a base point if we're fundraising five years for Central Library yeah. to have updated, inf this information updated. Sure. Yeah, so that I think be Peter's question is about can the library, do we have the infrastructure and the capacity to do this in the house? The answer is no. Mm -hmm. But does that mean that and if, if you know Mike moves to California in two years and we need that data, like we've got something to start with, if he lets yeah. us use it, can we hire somebody, a firm, or could we talk to them? Or you could replicate it and this is just giving you a, a vision of what some possible types of Will we maybe need that position and that expertise in house down the road? You know, yeah. quite possibly. Okay, capstone summary. Uh, 
there's the median, what I call the median patron. So among all patrons, you're going to have to look at the small mouse over here, but the median patron, the most frequent patron is in Albemarle County. Uh, the most common branch is central. Uh, most, I think it's common. Oh, that's the most common frequently used branch across. Eh, I don't, I'm not sure. I just did this two hours ago. So that <laughs> third line, I'm not so sure about. The most common home branch is, is north side. Uh, the median distance among all patrons, the very closest branch, is two and a half miles. Uh, the average patron uh, circulates 28 uh, physical materials a year and about 5.8 or six, call it six digital materials per year. I'm a six foot tall. Yeah, I, well, I didn't, well, I thought about that. And, well, I have a, there's some juvenile, yeah. It's much shorter than that. And I check out a lot. this is the average of all those dots. Uh, that's where that's the center of mass basically uh, is Everyone's located the right there. <laughs> okay. Now you can also slice this down. You can slice this down and say, well, in uh, uh, oh, I want me, I want. I think want, really Gordon Avenue. That's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if we took Nelson only, uh, there. Physical circulation is 27 and, and 4.7, so it's, they're slightly different per uh, jurisdiction, for example. Uh, their median distance is seven and a half miles, and this is where the average uh, Nelson patron is located, again, or center of mass, let's say. Yes, yeah. it's right about there. <laughs> uh, and so on and so forth. You can this, this reminds me of when you... You never said you were at. You know, you, you look up something, you look up something in Google and you say, you know, where is this? And Google can't find it. They put it in Hutchinson, Kansas. So there's a lot of people yeah. in Hutchinson, Kansas, you know, that, that, that there's from <laughs> nexus. So in the cleanup step for this, the, the original geolocation, I ran into that sort right. of issue. Yeah. And that was part of the process of getting that, uh, those lat long points in a kind of reliably Assigned. I guess the only right. bit of data that I think is really going to be extremely different when we load fresh data here is the digital yeah. Yeah. because yeah. we've all seen that 30% growth year over year for yeah. the last five yeah. years. Oh, so it's going to be dramatically different. How do you deal with people moving out? Departing. Have you been purging your roles? Yes. We've there's a roles on a three year basis. Okay. No, it has. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Well, my data is whatever David gave me out of a certain date. And so, this, yeah, this is a static data set. Yes. Correct. Five years. Yeah, ago. that's a good point. It's not connected to the library system in any way. It's just a snapshot of when we ran it. So that probably should be slow somewhere here, like the data set is from such and such. Uh, this is online, so all of you can play with it. All you know. Many hours as you want. Um, <laughs> the little uh, barcode in the poster will get you there, but also the uh, URL, maybe this can get into the minutes, is uh, I'm going from memory, but it's bit.ly, so bit.ly slash, and then this right here, the JMRL dash usage dash math. And that bit.ly short link ends up redirecting to this platform, which is hosted on a platform called Streamly. So enjoy, and thanks for your insight. <laughs> Oh, in five years, you're going to come back and update that. <laughs> right. Well, you're not off the hook yet because we need a policy committee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just to get back to well, the thing. Well, thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I, for a while there, I was thinking about you hand entering all that. Data. So I'm like, oh, yeah, great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, they can disaggregate that. Okay, the yeah. board policy committee met today, and the report is the same as last month or, or last uh, meeting. We continued discussion of the material selection policy. Uh, we will not have a draft for the board until after our. The earliest we'll have one is after our uh, next meeting, which is in, which is in two months, uh, and it's because it's, it's an important policy, and there's a lot to discuss. Thank you. Any questions? And personnel committee report. We met um, beginning of the month, and while all requests that we reviewed, we do consider to be very important. We bigger and be fixed. The focus on was addressing the salary gap that we have, and we have prioritized that. And then we went through with the other requests and kind of put in order what we thought could possibly be worked with. 
as well as some a couple of things that we're going to look for outside funding for from the friends or and we have the request for in here for your index yes mm -hmm. i don't know if i need to that's our segue into the FY26 budget discussion of the personnel committee recommendations. Ask our director to fill out his name. Uh, so, where we are in the cycle right now is, as Brandy mentioned, the personnel committee met a few weeks ago, um, came up with a recommendation for the board, which was basically to focus on priorities one, two, and three here. Um, and now the budget committee is meeting a week from Monday uh, in order to hopefully have a draft fiscal year 26 budget ready for you all to vote on in November. I'm going to say this repeatedly today, but the November meeting is a week early on the 18th and it's in Scottsville and we'll need to have a quorum in order to get the budget voted on. So uh, just reminding everybody that it's a bit of a tweak in location and time. If anybody needs a ride, I can um, So effectively, the, the top priority was uh, to address lack of movement on JMRL salary scale. What the personnel committee talked about was raising the entire pay scale by an amount up to 5% and then potentially seeking a raise for current staff on top of that of 2%. So that would mean hiring 5% higher than we are now uh, and also um, our substitutes, which do not get annual raises, their salaries would move up because they're at the bottom of the pay scale by 5%. So there's that. Uh, that in and of itself is a several hundred thousand dollar lift for our jurisdiction. So it's a big, it's a big ask uh, that they are all aware of. And then the two um, services uh, positions that the personnel committee mentioned are up here. It's a thousand hours for circulation substitute uh, support at Northside and 780 hours for um, branch support substitute hours at Northside. The rest of these were prioritized by the uh, personnel committee there. The top priority uh, that is not, they were not recommending be included, but they uh, want the board to be aware of and the budget committee to be aware of was the IT digital branch 25 hour web content specialist, which was already in its second year of being trusted. And then on down the line, support for Northside Reference, Central Children's, Northside Children's and Young Adult. Um, another CERC support position for Northside, and then uh, a Scottsville 20 hour per week for its support position. The only two that the personnel committee uh, decided to table were two requests for summer help, which was uh, an unusual thing that we had not seen in our operational budget before, but Jay Merle has provided summer interns for years now in two formats. One, as the Friends funded um, JMRL NAACP intern. I think it went so well at Louisa last year that they requested funding for their own summer um, participant. And the other is the KIP program that the city of Charlottesville runs. It's the Charlottesville Albemarle Youth Internship, Internship program. program. Thank you, Krista. Uh, and that's uh, the, the, it's mainly high school kids that the city of Charlottesville vets and places and organizations around the town, and they pay you that salary. So that's neither one of those have been operational requests. And I think the personnel committee felt that we could seek outside funding for those, whether that was from the CACF friends funding or in Louisa. Uh, we missed the boat, but um, Amazon is offering some funding for the, the county there. So if not next year, maybe the year after, we'll seek some outside funding for internships there. Um, so the draft budget that uh, Jerry basically has ready to go, we're ready to send out. The only reason it didn't go out to the budget committee yet was to wait to hear from the board today to see if there were any major changes from what the personnel committee recommended. So to make sure that the board isn't going to say, well, actually, you need to prioritize this. And then we would put that in the figures that go out tomorrow for the budget committee. So discussion on these priorities, do we think these are valid? We think they need to be rearranged. But these are all priorities. We're not, the personnel committee didn't reject. No, them. these are all the requests that came in from JMR. Right, right, just priorities. All visible here, right. And they organized them in what they felt was the most important for the organization. So when Jerry does the budget, he'll, these will be options. 
Right now, the budget that's going to go out tomorrow only includes the top three. Okay. Those are the recommendations that came from the personnel committee. But the reason I didn't send it was to see if the board yeah. wanted to include any other information. Questions, comments, suggestions, questions? I think this looks good to me, but I'm sure everybody had a chance to weigh in. Mike? David, for priority number one, is yes. that more of a compression issue or just overall competitive landscape? It's overall competitive landscape. It's not compression. And in fact, it's not going to do too much about compression if everybody moves at the same. Sure. The areas that we have compression are still going to have compression. They're just going to be 5% more yeah. there. But it's, that's not what the prior, the meaning of this priority is, hey, we've got this compression issue that we're always struggling with, and that's specifically what we want to address. Yeah, well. right now, this is still addressing the results of the salary study that JAMRAL did that showed that uh, that we were below market minimum across the board, basically, from the yeah. bottom of the pay scale to the top. Right. Generally, somewhere between 20 and 25%. Yeah. Not great that that's the case. Great that you understand it. Explain that. Yeah. I don't think we need a motion. I'm seeking board direction here. So if the board says if there's a consensus that the uh, personnel committee's recommendations stand, then we're ready to go for the budget committee to review it next week. Everybody good with this? Yeah. Right. So next month, week early, Scottsville budget. Yes. Okay. Um, moving on, the all staff training day report. Um, I got the opportunity to attend at least for the morning at free lunch, which was great. Um, it was really, really uh, uh, informative program, and I'm uh, very glad I got to it. Of course, nothing is free. So the, <laughs> the, the lunch was uh, paid for by the, the friends or, or JML, I can't remember. Um, thank you, Tony, for coming. I think it meant a lot. Tony did uh, um, did a, a morning welcome for everybody and then also helped hand out the service awards, which is one of my favorite parts of the year. This is the only day in the year when all the JMRL staff get together. So this year was at the Green County Library. The reason that we could do it at Green County is because Piedmont has a space upstairs that was available for us to rent, uh, including a, a hall large enough for the 120 JMRL employees that were there. Um, I did, I, I shared with you all already the um, the agenda for the day, but uh, just to bring it up again. So we, we started uh, with the introduction of new staff service awards. I gave a talk to the staff about where we are right now. And then we had Nan Carmack from the Library of Virginia, who's also the who was the president of the Virginia Library Association until the LA last week, and she handled the book um, on emotional intelligence in the library. Delicious lunch from El Carbone. Um, and then breakout sessions. The most popular one by far was this Tiny Habits for Work with Stephanie Weldy. I wasn't able to attend it, so I still don't totally understand what happened there, but the staff loved it. I think it was just making small changes in your daily tasks in order to, to be happy, healthier, and more efficient. Um, the notary Q&A was also very uh, popular with Brittany, and I was at the Best Practices for Ergonomic Health. And then we also had uh, Ocean Aello from The Haven downtown talk to staff about working with the unhoused population. We had serving older adults with Ginger Dillard of Java. Ginger actually couldn't make it, so it was the person in charge of their uh, programming there and then two other folks. Because at the Greene County Library, the downstairs space is shared with the Jefferson Area Board for the Aging, so there's a lot of crossover in the, in the staff there. And also there, uh, not in the staff, in the patronage. Their service area is basically the planning district, so it's all JMRL plus Fluvanna. So all of, our, all of our libraries have some sort of interaction with patrons who use Java. And then also very popular was um, Bill Henry uh, is associated with the Historical Society in, in Green talking about the um, displacement in the um, in the Blue Ridge Mountains before the Shenandoah National Park went in. So great day, really enjoyed it. Um, I wanted to, I'm sorry. Oh yes, thank you. I have a gift for you all, but first I wanted to, to um, publicly recognize the folks that got their years of service. So five years of service at JMRL, we have Jennifer Whitley at the Crozet Branch, Tisha Colvin at Gordon Avenue, and Danielle Van Leer at Scottsville. Ten years of service, Ann Marks at Crozet, Kelly Tacombe here at Northside, Megan Reed at Nelson, and Brittany Eversberg. Fifteen years of service, Rob Dillard, Central Maintenance, and Haley Tompkins, Crozet Branch Manager. <laughs> and 35 years of service, if you get down to the Central Library, Tina Jackson from the Central Library's uh, Circulation Club. So, uh, yes, yay for them. Every year we give staff a giveaway at the end of 
what used to be called in-service day and now is all staff training day. And this year it is a lunchbox, um, which I love. It's insulated and uh, big enough for my whole lunch, which is a lot. So the board, <laughs> each, the board each gets a lunchbox this year too. So it's on the side. And that's all I have to report from the uh, all staff training day, Tony. I'll do it. <laughs> Second lunch. <episode laughs> that. I was like, that was a lot of food. <laughs> and then the other success is the Friends of the Library book sale report. Yes, so the final, the total from the fall 2024 Friends of the Library book sale, they raised $166,367 on 5,370. So a little more than the past spring, and uh, more than fifteen thousand uh, dollars more than last fall. So they continue to see tremendous growth from being at the, um, the shopping center across the street here. Last week was National Friends of the Library Week too. So I'd like to publicly thank Jamerals, award-winning Friends of the Library board, staff, and volunteers for their tremendous efforts this fall and always. Jamerall couldn't provide the level of programming we do without their support. Last fiscal year. 2,800 programs that were attended by almost 86,000 people. All those paid for by the friends, 15% uh, more programs over the previous year and over 25% more attendees. So that's pretty good scale there. In fact, uh, both numbers of programs and attendance are up since the last full pre-COVID year, since 2019. That, it took a hit, obviously, when the buildings were shut down, but programming is back up to greater than it was in 2019. None of that's possible without the friends. So if you see the friends, go Be followed by the lobby record report. I feel like Mike I'm just talking. <laughs> um, this is kind of budget news, uh, but um, I will report to you all that I met with the uh, heads of the five jurisdictions for the annual pre-budget meeting, which always has to happen before October fifteenth, uh, I think. So we met with the county administrators from um, from Louisa, from Nelson, and staff from Albemarle and Charlottesville. We met in Greene County as well. Um, they appreciated hearing about Jamrall's plan, so I talked to them about the pay scale issue that, that we're going to attempt to uh, look at again this year. So again, without having a brand new pay plan, which has been gummed up a bit, this is year two of kind of trying to do what we can within our current budget and systems to move everybody up. So. They all understand that jurisdictions are dealing with very similar comp issues in our own hiring and retention. So it's not it's not um, out of left field request to them. It's just a matter of what they can and can't afford and hire in their upcoming practices. In that meeting, though, we did talk about uh, state aid quite a bit, uh, and this board has heard quite a bit about state aid. It's not been fully funded since 2001. That was the one and only time it was fully funded according to the formula in the state code it says you get this many dollars from the state for this many people you serve this many jurisdictions working together um, but if the second year of the governor's biennial budget holds there will be full funding for the second time ever and first time in 20 plus years uh, that came up in that meeting and um, louisa county added it to their legislative priorities discussion that they had with their elected officials that represent the county. Uh, this Elmar has done this in the past. So uh, they were discussing it. I'm pretty sure it got added, but they wanted to pass on to their elected officials how important it was that the state uphold their end of the bargain so that that cost doesn't fall back on the jurisdiction. So much appreciated. Um, I wanted to share with you all a publication that uh, Jay Merle's young adult staff put out. In April of 2024, the young adult staff held a system-wide poetry contest to select a Jamrall Teen Poet Laureate. Uh, the winner at that time was Rose Brennan Wilkinson. This fall, staff have collected the entries into a lovely journal that's available at all Jamrall branches. So I'm just sharing with it, sharing it with you all because I thought it was a, a really nice finish point. Um, I mentioned Haley Tompkins, 15 years of service at Crozet, uh, but I have some sad news, which is that Haley is leaving Jamerall after 15 years. So she's gotten an opportunity to spend some more time with her growing family. So uh, we are going to be hiring for our new Crozet branch manager for the first time in a long time. Um, but anyway, if you get out to Crozet, tell Haley congratulations and how much we're going to make. Tell her she can't leave. Tell her she can't leave. <laughs> so that's fine. We'll just close the branch. <laughs> And uh, the last thing that I have to report is uh, thanks to the support of the Friends of the Library, Gordon Avenue is adding a second bank of folds lockers 
So uh, if you go in the front of the building there, they had one, they were always full. Uh, the CACF uh, request for last year included funding for a second one. There, there were some initial issues of getting it in place, so it's not turned on yet, but it's there and it should be on fairly soon. It will move from uh, 22 more lockers, so we're going from 17 to 39. This is one of the requests that staff put in for the friends family of funds in the spring after our continuing. Can you remind me, do we have any hold lockers that are not co-located at a branch? Not currently, it, with the exception, uh, no, we don't currently have any holds lockers that are that are not at a branch. The kiosk that's in Nellie's Ford in Nelson has some holds functionality that hasn't been turned on yet, but staff are working on a plan to enable that. It's that's not a locker. Kiosk is pre-stocked. Is, is, yeah. It's pre-stocked right now, and it's a lucky day collection. So what's there is what you get, yeah. but it has capacity to accept holds. We just have to enable that and figure out how to best message that to people and that, and make sure that people understand that the timing of it is going to be a bit yeah. delayed. It's not as easy as, as getting the book at Nelson and putting it in a locker outside the building. And how many of these kiosks do we have that are not co-located with a branch? We don't have any that aren't sitting on a branch. No, we just said one in Nelson. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the kiosk. Oh, I'm sorry. How many kiosks do we have? We have yeah. one kiosk. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah. 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 Do we have any numbers about yeah, they're they're reported in the um, in the monthly report there. So we don't have. I thought we have one. At, we don't have one at Zion. No, I think I'm interested, and I think that um, that Louisa County might be interested in that. There's a there's the cost of a machine itself, and that's kind of it's not too bad. Uh, but then there's a getting it filled and getting somebody out there in order to it's a personnel cost basically. Yeah. Plus there are some costs that we're buying for the Nelson. The uh, Nelson kiosk, we're buying new materials specifically for that. The initial seating for that came from the Grow Nelson Library donations there, but you, you don't want to just rely on, you want things that are very popular, yeah. right? Uh, so you want to get something separate. So it's not, if it's the brand new Grisham book, you don't want to take one out of the rotation for everybody in the system for like right. up to so four. To get materials. So there are other ongoing costs associated with it. That's all I have to report. Thank you, David. Other matters. That was my favorite category. <laughs> I think I have a few. <laughs> well, just, Again, just we one I already mentioned, which is that the budget committee is meeting uh, next Monday. And the budget committee is, I think, most of the, the full board. So don't forget that. It's, it's an important discussion. And, and then that is here. That is here uh, in this room at 2.30. 2 2.30. Thank you all very much. Next month. And then also, uh, Peter and I had some discussions about holding a technology committee meeting. And I think the current plan is to try to hold one in December, so kind of after the all the budget stuff is done, uh, sometime in December, either before or after the December 4th. So if you're on the technology committee, expect to hear from you. A future agenda items for our meeting in Scottsville one week early. Did I mention that? That's the one. That's the big one. I'll mention that that meeting is going to be in Scottsville a week early as well. So the date is what? The date, November 18th. 18th. November 18th. Thank you. And, and uh, I will send out some information about that. Um, if folks want to carpool from town here, we'll pick a convenient spot and I can I can grab people if they're interested. Other agenda items will have continuing education of some sort. Yes, Ann Lindbergh is working on a continuing education course. And that will probably fill the available time. You got to see. But it usually does. <laughs> All right. May I have a long awaited motion to adjourn? All those in favor? All right. Any opposed? Thank you. Before you go home. <laughs>